Welcome uh, to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum tonight. I'm Chuck Bombardier, a rehabilitation psychologist in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Washington. I'm the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury Model System here at the UW. Uh, the forums and the video recordings and our online media content are made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Tonight we are pleased to welcome Kristen Copang, a physical therapist at Harborview Medical Center, um, whose presentation is called Get Moving, Exercise and Spinal Cord Injury. After Kristen's presentation, um, we'll open things up for the audience to uh, ask questions. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thank you. So welcome. Um, I'm pleased to be back here. I came for my first lecture of last year. Uh, so my background is a physical therapist. I've been a therapist for 17 years. Um, I spent the first six years over on the East Coast, and I've been over at Harborview Medical Center ever since then, working in both in the inpatient rehab and the outpatient rehab facility. So my objectives tonight are to discuss the benefits of exercise after spinal cord injury, to make sure I can differentiate the benefits of ex the different types of exercise. So really contrasting and looking at flexibility, at strength training, endurance training, cardiovascular fitness, training in spinal cord injury, to talk a little bit about the barriers to exercise, and then strategies to overcome these barriers. How to practice different types of exercise, and then how to identify strategies to keep with your exercise program or to maintain yourself on a, on a program that you started uh, for that. Certainly after spinal cord injury, one of the things that we worry about is that you have this physical deconditioning you have a muscle paralysis that impacts what exercises you're able to do, and you have this limited set oftentimes of what you were able to do beforehand, whether you're incomplete, complete, whether you're a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. There's certainly a different realm of exercises that are open to you at that point in time after your injury. And oftentimes you have a shift in time demand. So when we think about a normal day and you had, you know, you wake up, you get ready for work, you go to work, you come home, you're, you're doing all these things, and you're trying to squeeze in exercise. When you have a physical demand that maybe takes an extra caregiving needs, um, a little bit more time to get ready in the morning, um, increased transportation time potentially, to try to squeeze in exercise is even harder when you have an injury. Um, and at times that makes it people sort of adopt this sort of sedentary lifestyle. And a sedentary lifestyle could be as much as sitting more than you were sitting before. And it's not that it's, you know, a, that you're choosing to sit, it's just that you are you know, in, in a wheelchair or you're using a wheelchair to get around rather than walking to and from the bathroom and that, that can cause less exercise than you had before. So thinking about um, how those things sort of impact your physical condition. And then accessibility and access to exercise is often a lot more difficult to get in and out of places to, to access equipment. What the research has shown in really general terms is that exercise after spinal cord injury has noted improvements in breathing, in muscle strength and independence, in circulation, in your body composition, in your self-esteem and self-confidence. It actually to helps to decrease depression and anxiety, and it often is a, a role, plays a role in, in preventing secondary complications such as a urinary tract infection, ulcers, or respiratory infections. And just in general, becoming more fit, you oftentimes are able to use more of the, the, the potential that your body has. So you're able to be more independent. You're choosing a healthier lifestyle just in general you often just feel better is, is, a, is an effect of exercise that we think is one of the most positive effects of exercise, that you're just feeling good about yourself and you're feeling like you're able to do things. And you become more efficient with daily tasks because you may have more endurance or you may have more strength to be able to do some of these things in a, in a sequential pattern rather than having to take breaks. And then you are able to maintain and maximize options for positioning and other equipment needs that might be available to you as technology changes through the years. In the general population, we look at exercise as helping to slow the rate of bone loss. All of us are going to have bone loss over time. That's just sort of a natural product of aging. But the less that you're standing or in a weight-bearing position, you're going to potentially have more bone loss. So exercise sort of puts a stress on the bone by pulling on the muscle, by sort of in engaging that muscle to sort of allow you to maintain that bone density. It improves the immune system function. It can decrease the chance of developing diabetes can decrease the risk of heart disease, high blood pressure and colon cancer, and it actually can improve like GI motility with activity or movement in the stomach and the bowels. So 
with spinal cord injury, so I mean, I, in general, that's just sort of the first five slides are the premise that exercise is good. <laughs> and I think we all know that. We don't need to go into much more detail about why, you know, what it does to your body. I think the general effect of exercise is that it's healthy, it helps you stay healthy, it helps you feel better, it helps you have both emotional and physical energy to be able to engage in daily activities. For spinal cord injury, when you, you look at the barriers and you look at some of the things that sort of impact your ability to exercise, certainly it's different for every level of spinal cord injury. So when we're looking at the spinal cord injuries that are a complete injury, they oftentimes are having more trouble with maintaining their blood pressure because you don't have this muscle return. So normally, your blood pressure is stabilized um, because you're, you have this muscular pump. You know, your blood flows from your heart all the way down through your body, comes back up through your heart and recirculates. And so you still have this sort of constant flow of blood going through your body. If you don't have the muscle strength to sort of pump some of that fluid or some of the, that blood back up to, to your heart from your legs, then oftentimes your blood pressure might drop. You might feel like you're, orth they call it orthostatic. You have this sort of sinking feeling. You feel lightheaded. You feel a little bit queasy. Um, those, those things, there's ways that you can address those with medications. There's ways you can address them with um, bandaging, like sort of ACE wrapping to sort of give you some vascular support or looking at ways that we can talk about exercise progression so you maintain your blood pressure at a level higher earlier on in the exercise program than, you know, just sort of rapid starting and letting your blood pressure drop down. For those individuals that have an injury of the thoracic level six vertebrae or above, um, you often have a, you have a change in pulse. You have a, a change in the way that your body reacts to um, a really difficult or a really challenging situation. So you're not going to have the same effect. If you ran a marathon before you were injured and you sort of were starting to get really sweaty and really your heart rate went up really high and you, you sort of knew you had this cue that you had to slow down a little bit because your body was telling you that it was, it was struggling and it sort of had this sort of this angry reaction, I think you call it, we call it a sympathetic reaction. Um, it, it allows you to slow down, but at the, the thoracic level, at T6 or above, if you have an injury at that level, so cervical spinal cord injury, um, you lose that ability to sort of gauge that response. So your heart rate may not go up, even though you may be just as exhausted. You may not get this, the same sweating, you the same fatigue. So you have to use different scales or different ways to judge how your body is reacting to exercise um, to be able to monitor how you're doing. So what we use is a rate of perceived exertion, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we go into cardiovascular exercise, but just to know that there's gonna be different ways that you can monitor yourself, and it may not be the same way that you monitored yourself beforehand. Same holds true with the temperature regulation, like we talked about with sweating and temperature. So typically the higher level injuries, um, we have to really monitor how they're doing and make sure you dress accordingly, you maintain a cool environment, allow yourself sort of freedom of movement with your clothes. Some of the precautions with exercise that we want to be careful of is skin breakdown. You guys hear skin breakdown probably everywhere you turn the corner. The skin breakdown is sort of involved in everything that you're doing with addressing your spinal cord injury, and it is such an important topic. And one of the ways that exercise impacts skin breakdown or could impact potentially skin breakdown is, is friction among the surfaces that you're engaging in. So if you are transferring over to a machine, a machine that maybe helps you stand or a machine that's sort of an exercise bike or a seated stepping machine or even an arm bike and you have all of a sudden this friction on this surface that you're sitting on that you're moving your bottom or you're moving your sort of your interface surface is a little bit different you have to really monitor your skin it doesn't mean that the equipment's bad it means that you have to sort of look at how your body is reacting to that equipment because you may not be able to you know, use it the same way that you did before you want to really make sure that your skin integrity stays intact throughout whatever exercise you choose to do. Autonomic dysreflexia, everybody familiar with that? Sort of over the years, hearing all about it probably ad nauseum, so making sure that you know sort of your body's response to stimuli that might be painful or might be difficult. Um, overuse injuries are really one of the most common problems with exercise and spinal cord injury. And it also is, you know, I think in, in general, it's overuse injuries are something that we have to be cautious of with, with any sort of exercise, whether you're healthier you have an injury because when you dive into a program or start a program really fast or really new, you may be putting your, yourself in a position where you're using too much of one muscle or too much of one motion at a time. And when you have limited motion or you have limited access to exercise, your exercise set has gone from the 500 pieces of equipment in the gym to the 30 pieces of equipment in the gym and you're doing those repetitively, 
you're putting yourself at a repetitive motion type of injury and we want to make sure that you're really protecting your body throughout the exercise to prevent overuse injuries. <coughs> when I think about overuse injuries that I worry about with spinal cord injury, I think about some of the manual wheelchair users and how much they're using their hands and how much they're using their wrists throughout the day and how much strength they're getting from doing that, from pushing, that you're not getting normally. And I very rarely will actually give an exercise to add strength to the wrist or the hand because you're using those muscles so frequently already. I don't want to overuse them even more. We want to make them as efficient as possible and we want to make them utilize, you know, as close to their, their normal capacity as possible. Sometimes spasticity could be a precaution with exercise. If you have a lot of spasticity that might throw you out of position or change your position as you interface with the machine or with an exercise. Some people with just more movement, they get more spasticity that you want to really make sure that you're watching what kind of your, what tone level you have. Medications could be a precaution, um, especially narcotics and medications that are sort of dampening your pain threshold. You don't want to do exercise that's painful. Doing exercises that are causing pain is not always the helpful kind of exercise. This is not a no pain, no gain type of exercise programming. We want to look at exercise as promoting a positive wellness and positive health. So the exercises that we choose to do should actually decrease our pain. They should not cause pain while we're doing them. And sometimes the exercise, if you're on a lot of narcotics or, or pain medications, you might be dampening your response to that pain and you're not really sure whether the exercise is causing your pain as you're doing it. So making sure that you have a therapist or somebody that sort of checks you out to see how you're doing the exercise to start with to make sure you're doing it appropriately is really important. And that could be from a therapist to a trainer to the physician that you're working with and, you know, and talking to people even with other injuries sort of surrounding you um, to make sure that you're doing them appropriately. Shearing forces sort of goes back with the skin breakdown. And then obviously machines and safety and injury are, are always a big issue. If you think about going back into a gym setting, um, being around machines that have these big weights that could be dropping at any time or other people that are coming, you know, and using equipment, we have to make sure that we keep ourselves in a safe situation that you know your limits uh, to be able to manage that. So we usually recommend that you have medical clearance by your physician before engaging in any new exercise program. I'm not really sure that there's a physician out there that's going to tell you not to engage in an exercise program. So I think, you know, what you want to get from your physician is what kind of exercises do you think might be best for me in my situation and how can, you know, how do you see me engaging in exercise? Do I need some help to get started or do you think it's okay for me to go ahead and, and get going with the exercise programming? Um, there's been a couple um, articles that I've been reading about exercise as a prescription. It should be something that every physician asks about throughout the course of your life, not so much just from, from an injury. When you go to the doctor and they ask you, how are you doing? Everything going okay? Do you have any questions? Do you have any medications that you're, you're taking right now? Do you have any pain? How are you exercising? That should be a standard question that physicians ask and we should think about that as sort of exercise as a prescription for wellness. That we should, it should be a part of your repertoire, a part of your daily activity, a part of the conversation all the time um, because it's good for everybody. It's been proven to be good. Um, there may be extra medical clearance that's needed for some of the programs that are available uh, here in this community as well as across the country. There's some programs that are looking at doing more standing or more electric stimulation or more weight bearing activities that maybe somebody has been sitting in their wheelchair for a couple of years and hasn't been standing that we have to get clearance for. So your doctor may have to clear you for some of those activities ahead of time and they would look at like a bone scan or they would look at sort of your, your general health and wellness and, and make sure that everything's okay so that they can help guide you through some of those programs. So the prescription for, for spinal cord injury exercise to me is going to be a detailed plan of fitness related activities to achieve specific health goals. And it should always include mode, intensity, duration and frequency and we'll talk about each, each one of those things. So you don't want to be always doing the same thing. If you're doing the same exercise, same time every day, at the same intensity, the same number of repetitions, you're not going to be able to get that benefit exercise. We're going to have to vary it up a little bit and it's also going to be helpful for you guys to have it vary up because you're going to be more engaged and more in tune about continuing with the exercise programming if you're able to, to, to change it up a little. When we look at the Academy of Sports Medicine, this is a sort of a busy slide here, but 
the Academy for Sports Medicine has exercise recommendations for healthy adults. And they, their recommendations for healthy adults are no different than the recommendations they, that, they, that they promote for anybody that has an injury or has any problem with any, um, you know, they don't specifically say spinal cord injury should do this or brain injury should do this, but they sort of categorize sort of a healthy individual and somebody that has an injury. There's no difference between what they're recommending other than the precaution to be safe with your body and safe within the parameters of what your, your body is capable of doing. So if you're looking at the chart, <coughs> at least it says at least five days a week you want moderate intensity, at least three days you want a vigorous intensity, three to five days you want to sort of combine those, and two to three days a week you're doing strength and endurance. And at first I was like, That's, that adds up to more than seven days. I, don't, I can't figure out what's going on here. So if you look a little bit closer, it's, it's more like you want to be exercising about five days a week. During that five days, think about three to five of those as being more aggressive, more aerobic, more you know, uh, endurance type of exercise, and two to three of those days being more strengthening exercises. You could also do them together, but you could want to have a little bit of balance of both of them. So you want to be able to sort of vary your exercise program to combine both cardiovascular endurance and muscle strengthening. I add flexibility in there, and flexibility is something that you can be doing every day. That's not going to impact so much your strengthening or your um, cardiovascular fitness. But you want to be looking at a five-day-a-week program. If you're doing zero days right now, you don't need to look at a five-day-a-week program to start with. You need to look at a one-day-a-week program. You need to start to work yourself up to, you know, slowly get into the, the habit of exercise. It's not that you need to jump to these standards. These are all just general recommendations. We've got we to gotta make ourselves successful to get to these, this program. So for people as individuals with spinal cord injury, certainly we talked a little bit about these, um, you know, considerations of dysreflexic heart rate changes may not be the same um, as a response. Short bouts is often a good way to start out with the exercise program. Um, so you can go five to ten minutes of activity, especially because you have a limited set of muscles. So you're not going to be, you know, maybe you're not running, throwing a ball, going to play basketball and then coming back and doing a strength program because you only have the use of your biceps and your shoulders. So you're using your arms at a really high intensity to be able to do the arm bike. Do that for five or ten minutes, then go, go to a lower intensity activity using an alternate muscle to see if you can get that to strengthen and then go back to a higher level activity. Because you don't want to do that 45 minutes of one muscle activity or one what muscle that you just want to fatigue all the time. You want to really make sure that you spread it out and make sure you're, ca you're cautious with what exercises that you're doing. And we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the uh, different types. So the, the exercise mode, I think, is, is essential to the su success of exercise. I don't know how many times I've joined the gym and, like, you know, two months later I'm bored because I go and I do the same thing. I go do the treadmill or I go do the elliptical and I do the same thing over and over and I never really get engaged in doing more or challenging myself to sort of even stay within the realm of that one machine. You sort of get into this sort of mundane habit of doing this sort of as a repetitive basis. The key of the, of the exercise mode is the ability to hold the interest of the user on a regular basis. Um, because long-term compliance with exercise programs is poor for everybody across the continuum. And it's definitely influenced by the pleasure derived from exercise activity. The availability of resources and costs is obviously a factor into this equation that ultimately determines whether or not you'll be successful with your long-term exercise program. And what I want to show you today through some of these resources is that it doesn't always, you don't always need the top dollar to be able to go and hire a trainer to be able to keep you on an exercise program. There's ways that you can do it to try to stay internally motivated to be able to access sort of exercise in the environment that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was mode. So frequency and duration. <laughs> Again, we talked a little bit about the Academy for Sports Medicine. So 30 to 60 minutes most of the days of the week, so th three to five days a week. Um, make sure that you make, you're, you're keeping in mind overuse injuries and you're not doing the same exercise every single time. But there's some other studies that look at just two to three times a week for 30 minutes are showing a significant increase in, in oxygen uptake. And the oxygen uptake is not something that you guys would measure on your own or I would measure on my own. It's been shown to just show, show a cardiovascular level of fitness. Um, and that can actually imp improve your lipid profile and some of the, the risk factors associated with heart disease and diabetes. For intensity, again, you don't really think about 50 to 80% of peak oxygen uptake. That's that number that the scientists are looking for. But you don't want to do an exercise that doesn't make you fatigued. You don't want to do an exercise that doesn't give you a little bit of like 
oh my gosh, I'm feeling tired. I just, you know, I'm really working hard. I'm, I'm working to be able to do some of these things. Um, because certainly to be able to increase your utilization of oxygen throughout this is an indicator that you're doing something good for your body and that your body is working hard and needing more oxygen to be able to maintain your level. <coughs> so you, we're gonna be looking at the rate of perceived exertion. The heart rate, again, is not always linear. Um, the talk test is a test that I actually teach quite a bit in therapy. One of the, the reasons is it's a very easy one for all of us to measure. And the talk test is that you want to be able to show that you're exercising at a level that you can maintain a conversation, but you don't, you, but you're not like stuttering every two words. So if I was talking to you like this during my exercise, I'm probably doing too much exercise because I'm not able to get three or four words out at a time. But if I'm having a full conversation and I have no change of breathing and I have no change of sort of, you know, I, I can tell you the story of my life without stuttering or without changing my breath or about without changing or catching your breath in between, then you're probably not pushing yourself hard, hard enough. So you wanna get to a point where the talk test is sort of gives you an indication that yeah, all right, I gotta take a break for a second, let me just, catch my breath, and then I will move on to the next story or, or be able to do that. So it gives you an indicator. You never want to be able to, you, you, I, I think pushing too hard is, is the area that I want you to avoid, and the, that's the area where you can't say more than one word at a time. Okay, so that's your talk test. The rate of perceived exertion has been studied a lot in spinal cord injury, and this is something that you guys can keep, um, it's a scale that's not, it's not really intuitive because it goes between this number seven and 20 for some reason or another. Um, it, there is one that, there's a modified version that goes between one and 10. But I want you to think about that middle terminology of that description. So this is pretty easy. This feels really light. Doesn't really feel like it's doing that much. This is fairly light. This is somewhat hard. This is really hard, or it's very, very hard. So you have this sort of per perceived scale of how hard you're working in that exercise or that activity. And what's been shown is that when you're in this somewhat hard category, so around a 13, around a 14, it's correlating to an aerobic level of activity. So if you don't have the ability to test your heart rate or that your heart rate's not responding the same as it would for an individual that's not injured, this is a way that you can tell that you're getting into that aerobic zone or that aerobic capacity, that your, your perceived exertion is that you are working at a somewhat hard level. If you can jump into these categories for spurts of going really hard or very hard and then come back to somewhat hard, you're getting a little even more endurance in that level. You don't want to sustain a very, very, very hard level because that's too much for the body to sustain for a long time. But you want to be able to sort of jump in between this sort of level 13 and 16 um, to be able to get that cardiovascular fitness that you're looking for. The other way that they have talked about it is that if you multiply it by 10, you're looking at about the heart rate that you're getting. So if you're about a 13 on the perceived exertion, which is the somewhat hard, you're about 130 beats per minute is, is almost correlative to that. Um, does that. Does that make sense? So you're sort of at this, this sort of hierarchy. So you could use this scale. You could use a scale that's sort of the talk test. Um, and if you ha if you're have an injury that you are able to monitor your heart rate pretty well, you can also look at that and look at sort of how you're sweating and how your body's reacting to the fatigue. The other thing that I think we look at a lot as therapists is looking at quality of motion. For endurance activities, and for activities that are for strengthening, if your quality starts to decrease, that's when you need to stop. You don't wanna be doing an exercise that's maybe you know this chest press and you're doing really well, you're, you're able to get this weight up, and then all of a sudden this next repetition, you're sort of, you wobble a little bit, I'm gonna keep on going, I'm gonna wobble a little bit. That's when you're setting yourself up for injury or setting yourself up for sort of a problem that, that could cause, you know, could cause an injury. So we wanna make sure that you're really able to do exercises with quality. That first repetition should be as good as the last repetition. We're not looking for really this big muscle bulk gain. We're looking for more of an endurance type of gain. So you want your quality to stay the same throughout. The same thing with like wheelchair pushing. If you're using wheelchair pushing for your endurance activity, if you're taking, <coughs> um, you know, one, by the end of like half a mile, one arm is doing twice as much work as the other arm because that, that arm is tired and you're having to self-correct and you're having to steer. You're, you're sort of overusing one side versus the other. You're setting yourself up for an injury. So you really wanna make sure that you maintain that sort of parameter of making sure you have good, good motion, good quality. It's helpful to have a partner in doing this 
because somebody else can sort of look at you and say, uh, you know, maybe you should take a break for a second and, and then restart again. It doesn't mean you have to stop, but just taking a little break sometimes will allow you to restart. <coughs> so the component parts of an exercise program are going to be your cardiovascular conditioning, muscle strength and endurance, and then stretching and flexibility. <coughs> for cardiovascular endurance, I would say the majority of the exercises that you're going to be looking at to be able to do are going to be wheelchair pushing if you're in a manual wheelchair, seated aerobics, an arm ergometer, which is a sort of an arm bike, some of these bikes that sort of <laughs> just use your arms for, for motion, swimming, rowing, cycling, circuit training at a high intensity. Um, there's some sports certainly that are rugby, basketball, some of these wheelchair sports that you're able to engage in as well as boxing or anything that's doing sort of an upper extremity movement. Um, those tend to be the most accessible cardiovascular exercise. There's a number of individuals that are walking that have an incomplete injury or that are able to sort of do more of a running. Certainly there's a wide spectrum, but these are the majority of the ones that sort of fall within that cardiovascular realm. So how do you do those and how do you actually do them effectively and what, what do you do to, to access those? Certainly there's a number of different ways that you can do it. So the, the NIC, NIC pad is the National Center for Physical Ability, Activity, and, and Disability. <laughs> you get those mixed up. Um, and it's a website that you can go to and sort of search all these different exercises and all these different programs. This is a free video. Swing your arms back. Alternate your arms. Together now. And march in place. Scrub it down at your side. Scrub out to your side. Now reverse the direction. I think about cardiovascular exercise in relation to the heart. So if you're doing things that are below the heart, down lower like this, that your, your hands are sort of moving you know, side to side here, you're getting some movement and some blood flow. As soon as you raise your arms above the level of your heart, you are actually pumping a little bit harder. Your heart has to work a little bit more you're able to get a little bit more cardiovascular fitness um, and use out of that exercise. The precaution is to do it within safe parameters. So if you only, if you have a C6 or a C7 injury and you don't have very strong shoulders or very strong upper body, I don't want you to come up here and move your arms just to get above the level of your heart. You have to do it in a really good posture, and really good positioning. So you really want to make sure your shoulders are level, that your everything that you can do to stay upright is, is in a good position and you're doing these repetitive motions over and over again, but not repetitive, only one motion. So you're not doing this for 10 minutes, you know, or, or one direction. You see how they're just sort of going back and forth, trying to get a number of different activities in here. There are some that are on TV. There's certainly some of the PBS websites have seated aerobics. It doesn't have to be for an individual with spinal cord injury, but there are people that are sitting down that aren't able to be doing any standing activities. I have some individuals that I've had use these videos and they do them, you know, two or three times a week as part of their cardiovascular fitness routine and then they change them up and they will do some, you know, wheelchair pushing or they may go swimming one day or they might do some other activity. And some of, the, some of them are for, for cost and some of them are for free. So there's a number of different ones that you can download, but if you go on the NICPAD website, they'll have a, a number of them that are accessible for you to look at. And then there's some other ones that, um, that I've seen and again recommended to some clients before. Um, this SCI Total Fitness is another, she's actually a therapist that has come around and introduced herself to a number of the therapists in the area. She's somebody that has sort of pulled away from being a therapist on site and she has her own, she's developed her own um, fitness program for individuals that have spinal cord injury. So she has different workouts for paraplegia and she has different workouts for tetraplegia. And you can join her site. It is a, it is a pay site. You know, so again, it's very similar to what you saw in the NICPAD. 
But what the nice part is that she actually has some progression, so it's not the same exercise program every single time. So you can go onto the site and sign up for a month, and she may give you workouts two or three times a week, and you can get different activities. And again, they're for all different levels uh, of individuals. And there's lots of different equipment that you can use within these. So if, so you don't have equipment at home, you use your own body weight for resistance. You can use hand weights. We have a number of hand weights that you can have that are like more like cuff weights if you don't have the hand strength. So you can you know have them on your arm so you don't have to grip onto anything. So some of the TheraBands that you have like this, you're going to be able to wrap either your hand around something or you're going to be, you know, tying them in a knot so you can put your arm through it so it's a little bit easier to access. You have a resistance band. Um, you could also invest in a pair of gloves or something that has like a hook to them and sort of hook or sort of connect yourself to a machine or connect yourself to some of these resistance programs. Um, and you can take a look at some of the equipment that I brought with me here today. Um, so again, that's just another resource, this SCI Total Fitness is the name of her site. She also has some nutrition sites for that. This is an exercise program on the NIC pad for paraplegia. And again, it's, it doesn't look that much different than the one that we just saw for tetraplegia. But they may have a little bit more trunk stability, they have a little bit more movement, so they're able to sort of access more of the range of motion they're going to get into. With all of these exercises, whatever you find online or whatever you find, you know, whatever search that you're going through, you can always ask your physician or you can ask a therapist sort of what they think about those things, have them take a look at it with you. And the, and the bottom line to me is that you're going back to those precautions that you're thinking about. Is this causing me pain? We don't want it to be causing you pain. Am I doing it appropriately? And is it making me feel good? <laughs> and is it making me like able to engage in, in exercise or an activity? Um, because most of the time they're just going to be general movement. It's not going to be a movement that you're going to put yourself into that's going to contort your body in the wrong direction. If you're capable of doing it, you're probably able to sort of, you're using the muscles that you have to be able to exercise. So those are some endurance type of exercises. When I think about endurance, I think about that sort of sustained energy, that sustained um, level of fitness, not a quick uh, big strength motion, you don't have to use a lot of resistance, you just want to be able to do something for a longer period of time. And I my goal would be for like a 20 to 30 minute exercise endurance program if you're capable of doing that. Again, if you're not doing that right now, you want to start at like a one or two minutes to work up to five minutes to work up to 10 minutes. You slowly graduate yourself into these. So there's certainly other ways to get um, cardiovascular endurance and a lot of you have probably heard of some of the uh, functional electric stimulation that's out there today. Um, the they basically are using electric stimulation to the muscles that are paralyzed that result in a muscle contraction um, and that outputs functional movement. And the way that that works is that they're putting these electrodes, for example, on your quadricep and on your hamstring. They stimulate the muscle on the outside so the muscle contracts and it allows a movement in a functional position. So it's often used with a bicycle. It's often used with a gait training device. So there's some of these devices that you can stand up in and get hooked up to electric stimulation and they, they keep your body moving. I'm in a walking position. The difference between FES, assisted exercise, and exercise that's sort of initiated from your own body is that if you have a complete injury, the FES is sort of stimulated on the outside versus from the inside. So it's not coming as a direct path from you know, your, your brain. It's coming from the muscle itself, trying to get the muscle to work. And the hope is, and sort of the research is hoping to show one of these days that that actually helps to re-stimulate and regenerate the spinal cord injury, and that hasn't sort of been true at this stage, at least for a complete injury. For those individuals that have some incomplete motor activity, so you're able to move your muscle a little bit, that you're able to kick your leg a little bit, but you can't kick it all the way that you can take a full step, or you can't move it all the way out to the side by yourself. The FES or the assisted um, stimulation has been shown to be helpful to gain strength in those muscles that you do have a little bit of movement in already. So that has been you know, where the research has shown the most improvement is these incomplete injuries at this point in time. It is some great, great um, research that shows how great it is for endurance, though, because it, it does help bring your heart rate up. It does help give you that cardiovascular fitness level. It helps your blood flow. It helps your bone density. It helps all these things that are really beneficial to keeping health and wellness. But you have to just sort of be cautious about where, where that falls within the spectrum of total recovery. So we're not looking at that changing the recovery function quite at this point in time for a complete injury. The challenges with the FES cycling are going to be the costs. Um, 
you either are at, you know, joining a facility that has those, which there's a number of them in the area, Pushing Boundaries is one of them. Some of the hospitals have some of the FES equipment, um, but also you can purchase these for home use. And certainly you, we may want to think about home use as being the most effective in the long run, because if you're able to use it for years on end versus just sort of as a per session as you go, you know, that may be something you want to look into as well. Again, your therapist or your, your doctor can help you with guide, guiding you with along those things as well. <coughs> so respiratory endurance and strengthening. Certainly SCI has an effect on um, breathing as well. So you, your inspiratory muscles oftentimes don't have as much strength as they had before, so you don't get as, as deep of a breath, or you're not able to sort of be a, as efficient with your breathing as you were um, prior. So there's a number of different exercises for inspiratory and expiratory muscle training. And this is one of the handouts that we did put on the website for you guys. Um, there's a number of handouts that are going to be on there. There's one that's on just general strengthening for upper extremity. Gym guidelines, so give you some exercises, samples that you could go to a fitness center and actually do some exercises with. Um, different techniques that you can sort of set up. A respiratory muscle training. Um, there's some you know, brochures out there from different aquatic, there's an aquatic groups out, out in Bellevue that has some exercise, pushing boundaries has information out there. There's a number of different ones that have sort of, you know, activities that you can engage in. When I think about inspiratory or respiratory exercises, I'm thinking about um, very, very simple exercises that we can all do right here. So we're going to go through a couple of them right now. <laughs> the, for the first one that I think about is just taking a deep breath and holding it for a few seconds before breathing it out. So you're trying to increase your vital capacity. So you're going to take a deep breath in, hold for a few seconds, and then slowly let it out. And oftentimes letting it out slowly sort of through purse slips is a, is a good way to do that. So try to just increase your respiratory function. You never want to hyperventilate. You never want to do these so you're doing them um, to a point where you feel lightheaded or you feel shorter, shorter breath. This is supposed to sort of increase that, that reserve. Another one would be to take a, take a deep breath and bring as much air as you can in as fast as you can and then before pushing the air out as fast as you can. So you're working the speed of inspiration and the speed of exhalation to try to get that strength to go <sighs> and so you're trying to get engage all the muscles that you possibly can to help you with that inspiration and expiration. Respiratory exercises are crucial for people that are in the level of spinal cord injury in the cervical range because you've lost the ability to use your entire abdominal muscles to be able to help you with that inspiration and expiration. So we'll learn a lot of these exercises throughout um, but they're great for everybody, whether you're injured or not injured, to sort of really focus on your ability to breathe during this, the better it is. Um, taking a deep breath in and breathing out, counting as long as you can and as fast as you can. An incentive spirometer, you guys probably all left with that the hospital years ago. Um, those are certainly something that you can use to be able to measure the capacity that you're able to breathe in as well. So muscle strengthening and resistance training, I think this is the one that we think of the most when we think of fitness. We think of sort of getting muscle strength or getting a little bit more bulk. Um, we're thinking about free weights, bands, elastic wall weights, circuit training, different machines, access to a gym. Um, I want to throw in there too that just doing regular household tasks can sometimes be a strengthening activity and that you don't always need equipment to do a strengthening activity. You can take a bag of sand or a, jug, a gallon of milk and be moving you know, in different directions and those can always be a resistance. You don't have to buy the fancy equipment to be able to to get to access all these resistance training. Most of the guidelines that we'll go through are going to be starting at a low weight. Again, we want to make sure that it's not causing pain. You go three to five sets. And again, this is just sort of a, a guideline. It doesn't mean that you have to do this exactly, but for a recommendation, to start with three to five sets of 10 to 15 repetitions, um, two to three times a week. And again, emphasizing the quality of move movement. If you're at the end of that set of 15, and you can hardly get your arm up because you're doing a bicep curl, you probably need to either decrease the weight or you need to decrease the number of repetitions. Again, you want to prevent the painful positions, take a rest day, and really be cautious for overuse injuries. So back to the, the NICPAD website. This is a seated TheraBand exercise um, video for spinal cord injury. And you'll just see individuals using different type of equipment. And this is in low-tech hospital setting or home setting. You can just use a TheraBand and a door. The TheraBand provides the resistance that you need. There's different levels and different colors of banding that provide the resistance that you want. 
And I'd like to emphasize again, just the posture, the quality of movement, making sure that you're not sort of pinching up at your neck and up at your shoulders, like your, your arms are coming up too high, but you're really working the muscles um, that are helping you stay supported and helping you stay um, upright. So what muscles are those? A in general, when I think about which muscles I choose to work on with an individual, I think about what they're doing throughout their day. If you're pushing your manual wheelchair, most of the time you are using your biceps, you're using your chest, pectoral muscles quite a bit, and you're using your hand and your wrist. Those are not the exercises that I'm probably going to choose for you. I'm going to be choosing all the muscles that are posterior or opposite of those muscles to help stabilize. So the muscles that you might be stretching out every time that you're using them. If you're using a power chair, there's probably less, you know, there's less muscles that I would eliminate. I would actually, you know, probably balance a little bit more both front and back of the body. But typically I'm actually focusing more on the upper back to help keep stability because we very rarely think about those exercises. We very rarely think about those muscles and those are the ones that are going to help keep you upright, help keep good posture and also help support you when you need to use the muscles that are stronger, that are doing your pushing and you're doing your, your strengthening with. So if, if that picture here shows you, um, this is basically a picture of the back of the, the body and you're looking at the shoulder, sorry, the shoulder depressors do this motion. So they drop your shoulders down, they sort of squeeze your shoulder blades back together. Shoulder extensors move this direction. So triceps, as well as your latissimus, dorsi, some of the muscles on your back there. External rotators move your shoulder in this position. Again, because most of the time you're sitting in a position where your arm is a little bit more internally rotated. We want to go into the back of this direction. Scapular retractors, so we're pulling your shoulder blades together. Those are those muscles in between your shoulder blades. And then your triceps that are doing a, an elbow extension. Those are the muscles that I tend to focus on with a spinal cord injury. Again, there's a number of different research studies that are out there. and We've talked a lot about these different research studies. And they, these handouts are going to be available for you um, to sort of look at some of these exercises as well. On the website, you can take a look at them. Um, so this, this is a study by Mulroy. Um, and they were looking at the pectoralis muscle, external rotation, retraction, and humeral elevation. And they looked at this you know, and they showed them in different techniques. So you can use them as a band or you can use them as a, as a cuff weight. Um, this is another one that's very similar. So now Zinsky published this in 2006. This is uh, exercises for similar muscles. Again, they're focusing on transfers upon being able to keep your body stable, keep yourself active and keep your positioning, you know, in the middle and lower trap, keeping your body upright. So anything you can do to think about, and if you think right now, if we all just sit here, and you have your arms to your side, whether you know, either you're on your armrest or just sort of near your lap. If you can raise your elbows up and then squeeze your shoulder blades together as tight as you can. And you should feel you know, the muscle in between your shoulder blades. And what you want to do is that position is a, what I think of as a muscular set. I, I'd like to start you out before you do any arm movement by doing a little bit of this. Before I reach for the cabinet, I want to pull my shoulder blades back and then reach because I'm going to be more stable. I'm going to be less prone to reach this way or to turn my body or to sort of change, change position. And I want to really make sure that my shoulders are set, that I'm reaching in a, in a good functional position. So you're pulling your shoulder blades back and down with every activity that you think about, whether you're injured or not injured, you want to think about that position. Um, <clears throat> the same thing with like propulsion with your wheelchair. If you're always bending forward and propelling your chair like this in a hunched position, you're stretching those muscles out. We need to think about pulling them back to allow you to keep an upright position, to be efficient with your push stroke, but still prevent yourself from like coming too far forward or losing your balance forward. Um, so certainly there's a number of different um, websites that will have different types of exercises. Um, I think about, again, quality of motion, making sure that you're not causing injury, and making sure that you're not sort of um, compensate. You're not compensating. So be, if just because you're weak and you want to, you don't want to, you don't want to go up to the next level just because it makes you feel good that I can go from a green band to a blue band because it might change your, your body composition, your, body, your ability to do the exercise. So if I can do shoulder extension like this, and all of us could probably do that right now, and I can then maybe do it with a band, that's great. But as soon as I add a different band, I go 
you know, like I, I try to contort my body and lift my head up and one way it goes the other way, that's too much resistance. You want to keep it a lower level resistance, keep it up to your 15 repetition, keep your body position and your posture as neutral as possible. Flexibility exercises I think of to sort of counteract that tightness related to seating posture and positioning. They're going to be gentle. There's not any bouncing. We don't want you to be bouncing back and forth. They have a long prolonged hold and they can be done daily. I'd like to do stretching exercises before I engage in some strengthening activities because it helps to warm up the muscles. It helps keep the blood flow if you're able to do it timing wise. So the muscles that I think of of getting tight for the upper body for somebody that's in a wheelchair most of the time are these muscles here in the front, your pectoral muscles because you tend to be sitting and you tend to be a little bit leaning forward, something like this. So your shoulders have a tendency to come forward. So anything that you can do to stretch your upper trunk out, um, you know, opening your arms like this. If you have a tilted wheelchair, you can tilt back and you let gravity stretch your arms, open up your arms this way. You can use a doorway and lean up against the doorway and rotate your body. So you're stretching into that position. Um, again, there's some more of these that have so here's the muscles that uh, you know need to be stretched. This is going to be more in the front pectoralis muscles. Your bicep muscle, if you're often using your bicep for everything, we want to stretch that out. Really try to make sure you're getting that all the way straight. Um, the capsule of your shoulder joint is another area that tends to get tight. Again, most of the stretching is going to be just sort of away from your body. There's a handout that's going to be on the website that has the difference between caregiver assisted. So if you have some need some help doing these exercises versus if you're able to do them by yourself. Either one is totally fine. It doesn't matter which one, you're, you're gonna get the same end result because flexibility is just gonna help to loosen up the muscle. It's not gonna be something that's building the muscle strength or it's gonna be changing the composition of the muscle. So anything that you feel, you wanna feel sort of like a pull away. We can do a, a neck stretch right now, just having your right ear move to your right shoulder. And if you're able to put your hand on top of your head, you give it a little bit extra assistance and you feel a stretch sort of down the side of your neck. If you're able to, you can take your left hand and grab your chair and give a little tug on your chair and you get even more of a stretch. So you're, you're getting that pulling sensation or that pulling feeling is what you want to feel when you're getting a stretch. You don't want a sharp pain. You don't want a sharp pain and you don't want to have something that, you know, is really irritating and you want to hold it there. So I tend to hold it for like 20 to 30 seconds for the flexibility, move back to the other direction. Same thing on the other side really get a nice stretch. Think about your breathing, getting a nice good deep breath in and out is really important. So these same studies that we talked about before show these different positions. You can do it in a doorway, both arms behind you, you're stretching your pectoral muscles. This direction, you can do it one at a time. You know, so one arm gets behind, you're stretching your arm, stretching your upper trapezius, your neck muscles. Now Zinsky did this, almost the same exercises Long head of the bicep muscle, the bicep muscle, you know, again, it's gonna be here. If you sort of put your hand behind something and let your wrist, you know, be behind you, you can stretch out that bicep muscle. And then I threw in some lower extremity flexibility exercises. Lower extremity flexibility exercises, again, I recommend doing them daily if you're able to. And some of the advantages of these are gonna be that you're gonna be able to use some of this equipment or be able to sit better, your posture's gonna be better, you're gonna be more flexible when you're dressing and bathing and, and accessing all these things. So we think about, if you think about the number of times that you're in a seated position and you're in a bent 90 degree at the hips, 90 degree at the knee and 90 degree at the ankle, you wanna counteract that position. So you wanna get into an extended at the hip, extended at the knee, and moving that ankle up and down so you maintain that flexibility. So if you think about what position you're in most of the day, your stretching is gonna be, how do I get out of that position? How do I change that sort of dynamic? So activity-based rehab is something that's um, up and coming in the literature right now and it's really great um, research that's going on. This talks a little bit about what we talked about, some with the electric stimulation activity um, for functional rehab. So it's gonna be like body weight supported treadmill training. So some of these machines that actually take your body weight up to allow you to then step or have somebody help you step or help move your legs so you're able to, to walk. Um, robotic assisted walking is something that's coming along in the, in the research. There's a number of different facilities that are sort of on the edge of releasing some of these robotic tr gait trainers. Um, <coughs> FES cycling and FES walking are, are also out there right now. And these are all great activities to sort of engage in. There's certainly an expenses and barrier. Um, 
they're, they're, what they're hoping to do is to maintain this sort of pattern neural pathway that your body's gotten used to sort of this neural circuit. Like if you take yourself through a walking motion every single day, you know, are we able to regenerate that neural circuit that the spinal cord is sort of uh, responsible for after the spinal cord has been damaged? And again, we haven't seen the sort of true proof scientific evidence quite yet, but we're getting there. Um, and it's something that I think is, is certainly more available and more discussed. And again, any further information, we can certainly go to your physicians or your therapists to ask them what the sort of research is um, at this point. We're definitely seeing lots of improvement in cardiovascular wellness and fitness because any exercise that you're doing is beneficial. Like we talked about in the very first slide, exercise is good for you and exercise is important. Whether you exercise in your room with a small piece of TheraBand or whether you exercise at a wellness center that you're paying a couple hundred dollars a month for, th it's good exercise. You know, however you're able to access the environment and however it keeps you motivated and it keeps you engaged in activity is gonna be the, the way that you're gonna be successful. Um, there's certainly s some of the um, pushing boundaries is the one that's most common out here. It's probably the biggest facility that we have in the Northwest that has access to some of this equipment. There's also some of these companies that sell this equipment for home use. So you can do an electric stimulation bike that you can buy for home. So you could do that on a day-to-day -day basis rather than do it at a gym setting or at a, at a center-based setting. Um, the RTI bike and the Motobed are two of them that both have electric stimulation um, cycling devices. And then the robotic assisted devices that we're talking about are not quite available for commercial use yet, but they're starting to sort of, they're, they're thinking like 2014, 2015, that that might be something that's, that's gonna be out there. Again, just to reiterate injury prevention, you really wanna avoid pain. You wanna avoid repetitive use injuries, even though you're gonna be limited in the number of muscles that you're able to move and the number of activities you might be able to do, just make sure you can maintain as much frequency and as much um, diversity as you can. Quality is essential. And then just, you always have resources in your medical team or your environment to, to help out or to ask any questions about it. <coughs> so scheduling this into your lifestyle uh, is, the, is the key question. So asking yourself, what are you doing right now for exercise? And if your honest answer is that you're getting through the day, getting up, getting you know, yourself to work or to school or to wherever you are, and that's about all you can do because you feel like you're, you have, you know, that's all the time that you have in a day. Think about you know, looking at a program that's a five or 10 minutes or, or how can I incorporate an exercise into my daily activity? Can I do it into my dressing program? Can I do it you know, when I am waiting for the bus? Can I do some more exercise by just you know, changing you know, the way that I go transportation. So is there, is there something in my life that can change that can add exercise in without increasing the amount of time that you're sort of committed to, to doing these things? Um, how can I do more just in general? And then are there any health concerns that you have um, that you need to discuss with your physician? Certainly with technology, and I'm not the expert on all of this, but there's a lot of stuff that's out there on the web that helps you track your fitness and helps you track your programming and helps give you some motivational tools. Some of them that I've heard of that have been successful for some of the clients that I've worked with have been MyFitnessPal, where you can actually go in and you can write what you've done. I went around the track four times today at about this moderate intensity and it'll calculate, you know, calories burned. It'll calculate what you ate that day and it'll give you sort of a percentage, it'll give you sort of goals, it'll give you some ideas that you can work towards. So that's one of them. I think the iPhone apps have some iFitnessPal, I think is another one. Um, OnlineFitnessLog.com. The Wii Fit, which is an exercise program. The question is whether or not there's anything that's available out there right now that gives you an accurate calorie count for a wheelchair user doing a certain activity. And I don't know of anything, I don't know if you've heard of any out there that's, that's accurate or if there's anything that you can think of, but um, the Nick Pad may be an area that we should look at. We certainly have a lot of resources um, and have done a number of research. The, the best way to do it, I think, is the, your physician will be able to do like a basal metabolic rate, you know, and be able to get, you know, basic numbers of how many calories you're burning per day um, in general. But I, it's, again, it's not a great correlative um, to do that. So yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I know of anything specific yet. Yeah, so the, he's talking about a, like a polar watch, like these like watches that have like a heart rate monitor and an activity monitor on them. It's called like polar, I think it's polar monitors. And I think Nike has one that's like a, iFit monitor or something, and they will, it's almost like a pedometer, 
measuring how far you would walk. It measures sort of how many calories you burn throughout the day. It doesn't know that you're in a wheelchair, so it's not going to be the same correlative, but it's going to at least give you an average, uh, maybe a target of what you're looking for, of how you're feeling based on sort of your perceived exertion, going back to some of those other scales that we did in the beginning. Absolutely. She's asking if it would be different if for a quad versus a para, and absolutely, because you're having, you have less muscle to propel the same body weight, potentially, you know, for a para versus a quad. So there's going to be a greater efficiency for somebody that has more muscle mass and more muscle access than somebody that has less. So that you would you'd be probably burning more calories because your body has to work a little bit harder to propel at that level. Simple logs. You don't need the technology to be able to do this. You can get create a little gr graph or a grid yourself and mark down what you're doing each week. Mark down that goal and then you can look back at the week and see if you've done that three to five times a week. See if you've been able to incorporate both endurance and strengthening. You can do it in your calendar. You can do it you know, on a grease board in, in, your, in your house. So anything that keeps you committed and keeps you sort of focused on that exercise. So the key to success is going to be your schedule, timing, finding an activity that you enjoy, making sure you're able to track it, setting your goals and identify all the resources that are available to you. The last thing about resources I wanted to bring up was that our recreation therapist put together a list of resources in Greater King County that include a number of swimming pools that are accessible, a number of gyms that are accessible, um, and centers that often have, have discounts for people that have um, <coughs> a disability. So that is also going to be on the spinal cord injury website. That's going to be at the end of this handout that you guys can write down as well as sort of where you get your, the, the forum information from. So take a look at that. There may be some resource in your community that you don't know about that will give you that access and that ability to, to get out and engage in, in some activity with somebody else or um, something that just adds to the variety of what you're doing. So are there any questions? So, so the question is, um, you know, he, when he's on the arm ergometer, it's, he's working pretty hard and he sort of feels like his arms are going to fall off before his heart rate goes up. You know, it gets to the point where he works through it and he's able to then keep his heart rate up at a certain level for a longer period of time. And is that typical of mid-thoracic type of injuries? And I think it is typical of that sort of T6 or above kind of area because your heart rate doesn't respond as quickly as it would if you were a lower injury or, or in, a, in a paraplegic in the lumbar level of injuries. Um, I also think some of it is just overcoming inertia. You know, your, the resistance on those arm bikes is actually quite high. <laughs> It is really hard to push the arm bikes. And I know that when I've done an arm bike, I'm not very efficient at it at all. You know, to get up to speed on that, I sort of have to overcome a, a threshold to be able to get into that aerobic zone because you're just working that muscle to get past that sort of initial, um, uh, you know, initial sort of weight. So you're, you're the, the, the muscle sort of working so hard to push the machine around and then you sort of get this rhythm going that your muscle becomes more efficient as you use it a little bit more. Um, so it, it could be a combination of both, but I do think it's sort of common that your heart rate doesn't, doesn't correspond exactly to what you feel like your perceived exertion of death and, <laughs> you know, really pushing really hard is. There's lots of literature on the website that you can go to, and again, as long as you adapt it and adapt it with the no pain, focusing on good posture, good positioning, preventing injury, that's where you want to start and really make sure that, you know, if you have any questions, definitely consult with your doctor or your therapist to see if they can help direct you. He's asking whether the exercises that we showed tonight were um, exercises that are prescribed for shoulder pain, and they're sort of the ones that we're trying to do to minimize pain because pain is, shoulder pain is one of the leading causes of inactivity and spinal cord injury. So the more that you can prevent the pain, the better off you are. All of those exercises are on, on the handouts that are available to you. And again, most of them are, are, I think about as being putting yourself in a position that's what I consider an open shoulder. So an open shoulder meaning a shoulder that's open like this, not a closed shoulder, not a shoulder that's sort of rounded and forward. Once you do this, all the blood vessels, all the nerves, all the muscles are in a really condensed, tiny space in the front of your shoulder. As soon as you open it up, you have more freedom of movement. You have more ability to sort of get a full motion. If you guys can just bend down like this right now and just sort of go into a slump and try to raise your arm up and see how high you get and then just get into good posture and do the same thing and see how much further your arm goes. You're going from a closed position to an open position. You have more motion. You have more freedom to be able to move. So trying to get yourself anything that you're doing, you're trying to keep a good position to start with to prevent that pain. 
and then focusing on the muscles that you don't use quite as much. So those muscles on your back, um, most uh, importantly, to be able to sort of keep maintain your uh, strength and fitness for your upper body. So the question is whether or not he should take on faith that exercise is good and just continue to do it even though it doesn't always feel like it's helpful or doesn't always feel like it's moving you in the right direction or uh, adding uh, value to your program. My, my guess is that um, adding a little bit of diversity to the exercise program will add a little bit of a benefit to your, to, to make you feel a little bit better. You should feel better with exercise. So it could be the type of exercise that you're doing or that you're not pushing yourself, you know, quite as hard or that you're not changing the frequency, of changing it. So maybe what you were doing, you could change to do one time a week and then add in swimming or add in, you know, a different venue or a different activity to sort of, so your body doesn't get used to it. Your body gets used to the same structure, the same activity day after day. And it's not going to process quite as well. It's not going to feel quite as good to exercise if you're doing the same thing over and over again. So I would, I would look at the type of exercise you're doing. And it may be that you even could decrease the frequency, that you didn't have to do it every single day. You could do it three to four times a week, but changing up each, each time that you're doing it, try something different that keeps you engaged and keeps you excited about doing it. Um, the, other the other thing that I would advocate for is um, I think having people to do exercise with is very, very helpful. It gives you that accountability. It gives you somebody to go out with. It provides that socialization while you're exercising. Um, it really allows you to sort of maintain that program a little bit better too. The question is whether or not the energy drinks um, are useful and safe to be consumed. Um, and I'm probably not the expert to answer those questions. If you're very fatigued by the time that you get to the gym, before you start exercise, my guess is that you probably need more of a break before you get into, you know, you might have to sort of time it where you do a transportation to the gym, have general nutrition. You know, nutrition is, is definitely, you know, akin with exercising well, that you're keeping yourself healthy and making sure that you're hydrated, making sure that you have adequate, you know, calories in your body. I don't typically advocate for people to take really high sugar drinks or high fructose things because that just sort of gets you a spark. It gives you a little bit of a boost, but it's not going to give you what you need to be sustaining exercise and endurance for a long period of time. So you want to look at sort of the logistics of how do you format your day to make it a little bit easier to get there or to give yourself a break so then you can, you know, exercise at, at a, a level of, you know, intensity that you need and then give yourself a break before you go home. So you sort of stage it in different activities. So certainly the nutritionist or the doctor is going to be better served to answer your nutrition questions than I am, but uh, that's, that's my two cents is that your, your hydration is definitely a key, making sure you're adequately fed and have good, good meals, you know, three meals a day and are taking snacks in there are well, well nourished is important.